Love Thee. We'll sing uh, all three verses. Number 146. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory and in less delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. This evening, our reading will come from Matthew, chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. 19 through 21. From the NIV. Do not store up yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Our song before opening prayer this evening will be number 416. Number 416, what a friend we have in Jesus. We'll sing all three verses. Mm, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, 
there's still a refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Pray with me, please. Dear Lord God in heaven, we come before you this evening. Uh, as always, thankful for the opportunity to be able to gather in your name. So very thankful to uh, worship you, Lord, to study your word, to learn more about you, Lord, to uh, commune and, and join with our Christian family, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you uh, watch over us, Lord, that you help us to uh, be good Christians uh, at all points of our lives, Lord, and every day of our lives, Lord, that you forgive us of our sins, Lord, that you strengthen us in the areas that we are weak and that we struggle, Lord, that you give us what it is we need to be able to live uh, holy lives, Lord, to be able to reach out to those that we come in contact to help win souls for you. We pray, Lord, that you watch over us, uh, those of us that are struggling, Lord, those that need prayers, Lord, need strength. We pray that you help us to reach out to them and help them in any way that we can. We pray, Lord, for this country. Lord, it's gotten off of its godly base, Lord, and we pray that you restore it. You pray, we pray that you help us to take part in that, Lord, that we show um, people the error of this country, Lord, and that we just help bring it back to a righteous nation for you. We pray that you watch over us in all that we do. In Christ's name, amen. At this time, would you please mark the invitation song, which will be number 560. The invitation song will be number 560. Our song before the lesson this evening will be number 311. Number 311, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, and we'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses. Will you stand, please? Mm -hmm. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, fall blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Be seated, please. Give them just a moment to turn the mic on. Y'all hear me okay? We're going to continue our lesson, The uh, Joy of Salvation. This is actually s winding up this lesson series. I'll have two lessons as we bring it to a close. But I want to talk about the joy of salvation specifically. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at the, the epistle of John, uh, 1 John. And I've always enjoyed that study, so I wanted to bring that as we, as we bring this idea of joy to a close. Joy of salvation is really not a subject we hear a lot about in the church. And I think if we can learn to be joyful and confident of our salvation, 
Uh, it certainly is more likely we'll tell more people about Jesus. We'll tell people about the blessings we have in Christ. And so we shouldn't be ashamed. Um, we should feel God's presence and tell others. First Peter 1, 8 through 9, Peter says, You believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I thought about Paul in 2 Timothy 4, one of my fav favorite verses, starting in verse 7, where he says to Timothy, his young protege, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And then he talks about the, the consequences. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I think it's a wonderful thing when we long for uh, the day of salvation, when we look forward to being with the Lord. And uh, we certainly don't want to have false assumptions about our salvation, certainly if we're in active sin, if we're in some sort of rebellious state of, of sin where we haven't repented, uh, that is a huge warning sign for us. We need to repent, but we also need to find that balance of enjoying our salvation, of feeling confident about our own salvation, feeling joyful and excited about being with the Lord, which leads us to the lesson tonight. Can we really know we're saved? I mean, is that presumptuous on our part to say, I'm going to be with the Lord, I'm excited about being with the Lord? I mentioned in the beginning of this lesson series that it's so sad when you're counseling with somebody perhaps on their deathbed facing a very serious illness and they're sad and they're depressed and they're like, I just don't know if I've done enough. I don't know if I'm saved. And so they're filled with doubts and remorse. And you're thinking this should be a time in your life where you're celebrating and looking forward to being with the Lord, not a time where you're dealing with your own doubts. So church, if you have doubts, let me encourage you, do something about it. Um, meet, counsel, talk to the elders, talk to me, we'll pray, we'll study, but I want you to be excited about your salvation. It's okay to be joyful. So if we have confidence and are assured about salvation, wouldn't that make us more joyful? It should. And, and so uh, John, you know, the Apostle John, I, I've appreciated his writings uh, he's known as the apostle whom Jesus loved. I believe John was the apostle that was leaning back uh, in the bosom of Christ during that Last Supper. He was a very intimate setting, um, one of the inner circle. John was the one who knew Jesus perhaps the best. And I think it's interesting that at the time of Jesus' death on the cross, he looked down and said to John, Behold, your mother... And he said to his mother, Behold your son. He gave John the task of caring for his mom when she was basically widowed and he would no longer be on the earth. So I'd like you to open your Bibles to 1 John. And um, uh, we're going to begin tonight sort of starting at the end of our passage in chapter 5. But what I want to do is go through that epistle of John. We're going to look at chapters 1 through 5 and hit the highlights and so it's like walking through a field, this graphic that I have on the next slide, you'll see that uh, it's like going over and turning stones over or kicking the dirt. It's like walking through the Bible and digging for those little nuggets of, of truth. And uh, I think that we can find some precious nuggets if we, if we go through the chapters of John 1 through 5 and hit the highlights, and we can learn some very valuable things. As a precedent tonight, what I want to do is start with this idea that we can know that we're saved. Uh, John says, I write these things that you may know you have eternal life. And, uh, and so let's go to 1 John. That should be our next reading. 1 John 5, um, 13 through 15 and verses 19 through 21. I'll give you just a moment to turn to that passage. And I've asked uh, several readers tonight. I want to thank them in advance for coming up and sort of breaking up the lesson. But we have six different readings. Uh, reading number one tonight is going to be Howard. 1 John 5, 13 through 15, and then verse 19 through 21. Listen carefully what John has to say about what he has written and our own salvation. Howard? Howard? 
All right, 1 John 5, verses 13 through 15 and 19 through 21. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked from him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding in order that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Thank you, Howard. So we see John who's writing to the church, and he says to them, uh, basically, I've written these things that you may know you have eternal life. He's trying to reassure the church. I'm giving you these things. I'm writing about these things. And think of it as a litmus test, a way to test yourself. If you can say yes to the things that I'm writing about in these first five chapters, if you feel that, that you are, in fact, doing these things, you're walking in these things, and you have this intimacy with Christ, you can say, yes, I know that I'm saved. I'm excited, I'm happy. Now, I'm not suggesting that any of us are perfect. We're only made perfect through the blood of Jesus. But if we attempt to do these things, that we find ourselves saying yes to this test, and we have several questions that we're going to be asking you through the night, then you can say that I know that I'm in Christ. We are in him. And so what we need to do is I'm challenging you tonight as we go through the first part of this lesson, and the next week we'll wrap up on Sunday night. We need to see what are the things that John has written to us. John makes some very encouraging statements. They're, they're, they're statements that, that really build us up and excite us and bolster our confidence in Christ. And so um, I want you to be able to say that you rest in that assurance that you are a child of God. I want you to be able to say I'm confident that if I were to pass away in my sleep tonight, if I, if I went to sleep and never woke up, um, that I'd be with the Lord. I, I was excited to hear Warren told me that I think we had a baptism last night, um, and, and so that's very exciting that we had a member of our congregation sharing the gospel with a co-worker, and they brought them to the building, and we actually had a person added to the Lord. That's very exciting, and so we should always make that a priority to share our faith to be excited about the good news. And so um, so we need to have joy. And our first reading tonight is 1 John chapter 1 through 4. Have complete joy. And uh, John says, I want you to join us, the apostles. We've been eyewitnesses. We've seen the power of Christ. And so make our joy complete. Dennis, come on down and read 1 John 1, 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. Do you have joy about your own salvation? Do you just get up in the morning sometimes and say, Lord, thank you for the great blessings that you've given me through Christ. Thank you for your blood, for forgiving me. I, I acknowledge that I'm not perfect. I know I disappoint you sometimes, Lord, but thank you for including me in your eternal kingdom. Thank you for making me a child. And it's such a blessing to be included 
in your kingdom. And God says, look, the greatest way to show appreciation to, for, to me for the gift of your own salvation is go out and, and tell others. Be joyful, be happy, be excited. And so we need to remember that, uh, that we uh, have joy. In 1 John chapter 2, if you'll turn over to chapter 2, you'll see in uh, verse 5, the text says, But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. So there's one of those tests that I'm talking about. It means that basically we have to keep the word of God. We have to be obedient. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that we keep it perfectly. We fall short. We disappoint God. Sometimes we sin. Uh, but we understand that we study the word. We follow the word as close as we can. One of the things that I appreciate about the, the culture of the church, growing up all of my life in the churches of Christ, we have been people of the word. We, we encourage Bible study. I grew up going to Bible classes, and I thank all those wonderful teachers all through my years, my formative years, who taught me the Word of God. One of the greatest memories I have growing up, my dad, when we lived in New Zealand, would have us do Bible readings each morning, and he'd say to us, as you read this scripture or this chapter, I want you to make a few notes, sort of outline it, what stood out in your mind. And so we'd gather around the table, and we'd eat breakfast, and we'd talk about what we read. And I didn't realize it at the time, but those were those were beginning to train me to think analytically, to think with my mind, to think about the Word of God and appreciate how to dig deeper and understand it. So I'm grateful to my father for helping me uh, study that Word and know the Word of God, and that Word confirms that we are in Christ. By this we may know that we are in Him. Whoever says he abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked to walk in the steps of Jesus. In 1 John chapter 2, drop down to verse 12, one of the other tests that he gives us is he says, I want you to be joyful, children. Um, be excited because he says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. And so he's saying to the church a term of affection, little children. Your sins have been forgiven. Now, it's not based on my goodness. It's not based on my hard work. It's simply the blood of Jesus, Ephesians 1, 7. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16, Paul restates the fact that that's what washes our sins away. I've asked John Foster to come up and now read John, 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. And um, he's going to also share with us a thought from John, one of these tests of being saved. So, John, if you'll come on up and, and read to us. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. <clears throat> Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But who does the will of God abides forever? Amen. Thank you, John. I tell you what, that is a powerful passage. First John 2, 15 through 17, he talks about the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The old devil... Um, I can say with confidence, he's going to try to hit you on one of those three areas. He'll get you. He'll, he'll tie you up with materialism. He'll tie you up with pride. You know, you acquire things, you purchase things to impress other people. Uh, or you'll get uh, involved in a lifestyle where maybe something feels good to you. It appeals to the flesh. And so you keep repeating that even knowing it's a sin. So we have to be so careful uh, to avoid what John shares with us in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. And remember that we have to constantly fight these tendencies to engage ourselves in these fleshly things. Let's look at that one more time. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, and then he mentions the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. This isn't from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So again, another test. What are the things that I really cherish in my life? What is it that I put ahead of God? The fact that you're here on a Sunday night to, to partake of the, the word, to break the bread of life, to study the word together is a wonderful indication that you've got your priorities in the right place. And I want to thank you for making a choice to be here tonight. So John has read to us from 1 John 2. There's three different categories of things that uh, the devil tempts us with. We have to remember that we have to walk in the steps of Jesus. We have to say no to those things of the world that tempt us. Now what I want to do is shift gears just a little bit, and we're going to begin a process of asking some questions. And so what I've done is taken the rest of our text through chapter, I believe, 3, and, and I'll be asking you some questions, some questions as a form of a self-test. How do I really know that I'm saved? And so Kevin's going to come and read to us, and the question is, what is his promise to us? What is the promise God has made? 1 John chapter 2, if you have your Bible, verse 24 through 25. Kevin? And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Amen. So John answers the question, what is his promise to us? The promise is eternal life. You know, my dad, as he was nearing death and growing more and more weak, he said, I long to be with the Lord. I'm like Paul. I desire uh, there, there's a part of me that wants to be here, but there's a stronger part of me that desires to be with the Lord. That'll be far greater. And I knew he meant that with all of his heart. And when Dad passed away on that fateful day, I rejoiced by the fact that I knew that God had given him that promise of eternal life. Dad passed with confidence. And so I just want to encourage each of you, I don't want to be morbid, but we all are going to die. We all pass from this life. And I, I want to encourage you to think about your life. Think about how you're investing your time. Think about your priorities. And remember that God has said, if you're faithful, if you put me first, then you know that you're going to be promised eternal life. Well done, good and faithful servant. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, the question is, was what does John want us to to have so I'd encourage you to look down at verse 28 and again he uses that term of endearment little children and now little children this is in chapter 1st John 2 verse 28 now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming if you know that he is righteous you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So the question is, what does God want us to have? The answer is confidence. He wants us to be confident. So if somebody says to you, well, if the Lord came, would you know that you'd go to heaven? Are you sure? You need to be able to say, yes, I'm confident that I would be with the Lord, that I would be welcomed into his kingdom. What a blessing, not based on my goodness, not based on my perfection, but on his grace and love. And each day I struggle to make God's priorities my first priority in life, to put spiritual things, kingdom things ahead of material things. Let God take care of all the rest and let me put his kingdom first and God will welcome me into his eternal home. Our next question is uh, reading number four, Kevin, 1 John uh, 2, uh, 24 through 25. What does he promise us? 1 John 2, 24 through 25. Kevin, would you come up and read for us?
Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I apologize. I think I repeated that reading. So Kevin looked at me kind of funny, like, really? So again, my point is, is none of us are perfect, Kevin. But God loves us. Thank you, Kevin, for being a good sport. I appreciate that. I apologize. John wants us to have confidence, and in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, thank you, Kevin, for reading twice tonight. You did double duty. 1 John 3 and verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So what does John want us to have? 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Uh, he wants us to have confidence. And then what are we right now? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. We are God's children right now. To be a child of God. That's such a wonderful idea. To be included into his kingdom and be made pure and to know that um, God will recognize us and know us. Now, toward the end of our lesson tonight, we're going to be talking about something that is a confirmation that we belong to God. It's not something that we talk a lot about, but uh, Jim Bryant uh, is going to be reading to us from 1 John chapter 3. Here's the question. What assures us that we have passed from death to life? What assures us that we have passed from death to life. If we can go to that slide, uh, it's 1 John 3, verses 11 through 14. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was the evil one, and slew his brother, and for what reason did he slay him? because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death unto life, because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. All right, so here's another one of those questions. If you're taking your test, how did you do? What assures us that we have passed from death into life? In 1 John 3, beginning in verse 11, he says, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. In 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, we're taught what love really looks like. And then uh, John shifts a little bit, and he says, okay, here's a great example of what not to be. Don't be like Cain. Cain uh, was jealous and envious in his heart because God found Abel's offering more acceptable. Cain became angry, and he he basically enticed his brother to come out into the field, and there he killed him. Why did he murder him? Because, John says, his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Don't be surprised that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. So, church, how do you know that you're saved? How do you know that you're going to heaven? Because you go out of your way to show love and compassion to your brothers and sisters in church. You can't just walk by and not be sad if somebody's suffering. You can't just walk by and not congratulate somebody if their heart's overjoyed in a great event. You have to be involved in the lives of your brothers and sisters. You have to take the time to say, I love you, and if you're hurting, I pray for you. What can I do to help you? We have to make that love plain and evident and not be uncaring or unloving like we see Cain, who was a murderer. So don't be surprised if the world hates you because you love your brethren in the church. But that is what assures us that we have passed out of death into life, that we have become part of God's eternal spiritual kingdom is our love for one another. We're closing the lesson tonight. We're kind of winding down, and I'm now turning to 1 John chapter 3, 
in verse 24. We see perhaps the strongest evidence so far that we are God's children and that we're heaven bound. Are you ready? You want to know what it is? Here is the strongest evidence that we are saved. And in 1 John chapter 3, if you have your Bible, let's read verse 24 together. It says, Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. And you're like, well, that's very interesting, Brother Tom. So what are the evidences or indications that the Holy Spirit is living and working in me? How do I even know he's there? Well, I would suggest that, first of all, you go to Galatians and study the fruits of the Spirit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering. Do you demonstrate those things in your life? Do you have a certain peace that God affords you even when the world is in turmoil? Even when you turn on the news and it's very discouraging or depressing, do you still feel a sense of peace and comfort through God's presence? These are indications that God's Spirit is in you. How many times have you talked to a fellow Christian and after you walk away you're like, there was something different about them. I sensed a connection, a nonverbal spiritual connection to them. It was almost like it was unspoken, but we knew. Have you ever sensed that before? You've ever experienced that when you talk to somebody that was a, a fellow believer and a Christian? I believe that that is a spiritual connection that God gives us. The ability to discern the word, to look deeper and to understand. These are gifts from God that he gives all Christians in the indwelling of his spirit. It's something we need to think about more and talk about more among ourselves is this wonderful indwelling of God's spirit that he gives all believers. We're told not to quench the spirit, but to let him grow, let him uh, overtake us and control our will to yield to the Spirit by crucifying the flesh daily. And so if you struggle with these things, that's a good indication that you're on the right path to heaven, that God is living and working in you, and that you're submitting to his controlling Spirit in your life. It is not an easy task, but one of the greatest benefits of the Spirit, according to the Bible, is the peace that passes understanding, a spiritual peace that comforts us. How can Christians get through extremely difficult times, a time of crisis in their life, because they rely upon the spirit that God gives them to give them peace? Not as the world gives peace, but as God does through his spirit. Even Jesus, referring to the coming Holy Spirit to the apostles, said, I won't leave you as orphans. I will send to you the comforter. To me, that's reassuring to know that while I'm on this earth, when I have a difficult day, a, a crisis in my life, uh, when I'm really sad or depressed, that God says, it's okay, child. I'll give you my spirit to comfort you and get you through these difficult times. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 is a reference to the spirit when Paul uh, writes to the church at Ephesus. I've asked David to read Ephesians 1 where it talks about the Holy Spirit, and listen to the word that he uses to describe the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. It says here in Ephesians 1.13 that we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Sealed is an interesting word because if you go back to the old concept of uh, a king he would take an official document and put a wax seal on it with a signet ring or he had a stamp that came from the king. Nobody was authorized to open up a sealed envelope from the king because it showed 
This is a document from the king. This is a document owned by the king, and it is sent with his authority. Anyone who breaks the seal, except the person to whom it has been sent, is punishable by death. Notice in the book of Revelation, we have the trumpet sounding, and everyone's weeping because there is a seal that cannot be broken, and all of a sudden there arrive, uh, there is um, singing and praises because it says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And he opened the seal. He had that authority. You see, we are sealed by God. His indelible mark is on us. How? The Holy Spirit who indwells us who comforts us, who gives us peace. God says, you belong to me, and an indication of my deposit in you, my ownership, is the Holy Spirit that I have given you. It is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession. In other words, all along our life's journey, the Holy Spirit says, it's okay, God is coming. You're going to go home. You belong to him. Get in touch with that Holy Spirit. Understand that Holy Spirit. Use God's presence as he intended in your life to comfort you and give you peace in difficult times. That is the blessing of being a child of God. It should give you joy. Our final reading tonight is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And Paul adds this as he writes about the topic of the Holy Spirit. We'll bring our lesson to a close. I simply want to invite you and challenge you to think about the assurance of your own salvation. Does it give you joy? Now, next week, Sunday night, we're going to wrap up this idea of the lessons from the epistles of John, a series of questions where uh, John has written things that we may know we have eternal life. And I've challenged you tonight by, by concluding this lesson by saying the Holy Spirit lives in you. It tabernacles in you. Do you feel his presence? Is he leading you? Is he guiding you? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal, we just talked about that, on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The Holy Spirit is a wonderful blessing from God, and it confirms that we are, in fact, his children. Is the Spirit leading you? Is he guiding you? Is he comforting you? Can you feel his presence? Well, it's a challenging lesson, but again, my goal tonight is to help all of us have a greater joy of our own salvation. I want to thank all the readers, especially Kevin, who had double duty tonight. (laughs) and read twice. Sorry about that. But it's a message, I think, that's worth telling. And I want you to be joyful, church. I want Stroudsville members to be excited about their own salvation, not to have doubts, not to have fears, but to be confident when we hear that trumpet and know that the Lord is coming to take us home. The invitation is yours tonight. We're going to sing an invitation song. If your heart has been touched by something that we've said, Uh, If maybe you need to confess sin, uh, maybe you've got something on your heart that you want to share, we certainly would welcome your response to the invitation. Whatever that need is, we'd like you to, um, to let us know what we can do to help you in your spiritual walk. Let's stand and sing together. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I 
I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. If anyone has not had an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, it is prepared. Uh, you can exit the rear of the auditorium, be shown where you uh, can be served. Our closing song will be number 388. Number 388, Take Time to Be Holy. We'll sing the first and last verses. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessings to seek. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love. Thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we are so thankful, Lord, that uh, we can come before you, Father, uh, that we can share with you, Father, what's on our hearts, what's on our minds, Lord. And we know, Father, that uh, you'll hear us. Lord, we pray that you'll help us uh, this week, Father. Uh, that you'll help us, Father, to, to have confidence in your word. Uh, to be able, Father, to, to stand up uh, to those who oppose you, Father. Uh, those who are being led, Father, by your adversary, Lord. We just pray that you'll help us to, uh, to do what's right, Father to make good decisions. Lord, we pray that you'll help us this week to, to study. Lord, that you will help us to, uh, to be better, Father. Uh, we're so grateful, Father, for um, all that we have, Father, in this country. Uh, we know, Father, we're blessed more than, than uh, many others, Father. We just pray that you'll help us to uh, share our blessings with others, uh, to be able, Father, to Use what we have to, to reach others, to, to share your word. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, those who make decisions for this country, Father, uh, that you will uh, prick their hearts, Father, uh, allow them to, to know your word and, and to make decisions, Father, that are best uh, based on your word. Uh, Father, we, we pray that uh, you'll be with us this week as we go to our jobs, Father, as we go to our schools, Father, that... You'll help us to, to be focused on you uh, daily, Lord, uh, that we will be joyful, Father, and in all that we do. Uh, cause, Lord, we, we know, Lord, that if we follow your word, if we do what you tell us, Father, that we have that, that home uh, in heaven waiting for us. Uh, Father, help us to, to be your people. Help us, Father, to, to fight hard every day. Uh, cause we know, Father, you're your adversary. Every day, Father, tempts us. Uh, every second, Father, is, is there whispering in our ear, and we just pray, Father, you help us to, uh, to fight harder, Father, uh, to be able to resist. Uh, 
all that he done. Lord, we pray for so many of our number who, who are ill at this time, Father. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you'll help them as they recover, uh, that you'll be with uh, each one of those situations, Father, and just pray, Lord, that uh, what is best will take place. Lord, we pray for, for those who, who don't know you, uh, who don't realize, Father, the, the good news that, uh, that you have, Father, that you've given us uh, through Christ, uh, that salvation. Father, we pray all things through his name. Amen.